Therefore, I suggest that we first consider the nature of justice and injustice as they appear in the Republic, and then examine the individual going from the larger to the smaller and comparing them. That's an excellent plan. Mm -hmm. Let's imagine, through our words, how the Republic comes into existence so that we can see how justice and injustice come into existence as well. That makes sense. Once we have done that, we can hope to get a better look at what we are seeking. Much better. Are you sure you want to do this? It's not going to be easy, so you might want to think about it. I have thought about it. There's nothing else I'd rather do. As I understand it, a republic comes into existence out of human needs. We all want many things, but none of us is self-sufficient. Can you think of any other origin of a republic? None at all. Ah. Because we have many wants, many people are needed to provide for them. We need ooh, one kind of helper for one purpose and another kind for another purpose. When these helpers and partners come together in one place, we call that collection of people a republic. True. So they trade goods and services, one giving and the other receiving, each thinking that the exchange is good for them. That's right. Then let's create a republic in our imagination, beginning with our needs. That's where we should begin. The first thing we need is food, simply to stay alive. True. Then we need a place to dwell, clothing and that sort of thing. Yes. To provide these things in our republic, one person must be a... A farmer, another a builder, and someone else a weaver. Perhaps we should add a shoemaker and somebody to take care of our body. A good idea. So, the most basic republic must include well, four or five people. That's clear. How should they proceed? Should each person work for all the others? The farmer, for example, producing food for everyone... Or should the farmer ignore the others, spending uh, a quarter of the time raising enough food for personal needs and three quarters of the time building, weaving, or making shoes? That way we wouldn't have to bother with other people and could simply mind our own business. I think the first alternative is better. I think you are right. Because it occurs to me that we're not all alike. We each have our own nature, and as a result, we are each inclined to different occupations. Very true. Will the work be done better when a worker has several jobs or only one? Only one. And there's no doubt that the job will be spoiled when it's not done at the right time. No doubt. The reason is that business won't wait for the worker to do the work at leisure, but it must have first priority. It must. Then more things are produced more easily and with better quality when a person leaves other occupations and does one thing which comes naturally and does it at the right time. That's correct. Then we will need more than four citizens in our republic. The farmer won't make plows, hoes, or other such equipment, at least not good ones. Hmm. The same is true of the builder of the weaver and the shoemaker. They all need many tools, which they are not likely to make themselves. True. So we will need carpenters, metal workers, and many other craftspeople in our little republic, which is now beginning to grow. It's definitely getting bigger. But it won't be very large, even if we add cowherds, shepherds, and other herders so that the farmers can have oxen to pull the plow and the builders and weavers can have animals to pull and carry their loads of raw materials. No, but the Republic won't be small either if it contains all these people. Furthermore, it's nearly impossible to place the Republic where no imports are needed. 
You're right. It's impossible. So we will need another group to bring what we need from other places. We will. But if our traders take nothing with them, they will return empty-handed. Of course. That means we must not only produce enough at home for our own needs, but we need ample goods of high quality to supply our customers. That makes sense. Won't that require even more farmers and craftspeople? It will. Well, then, of course, we will need merchants to import and export our goods. Yes. We will probably trade by sea, so a large number of skillful sailors will be required. Yes, a large number. But how will they exchange goods within the Republic? That was our original objective. They will have to buy and sell. Ah, for that we will need a marketplace and a common currency. That's right. Now, suppose that a craftsperson, a, a farmer, for example, brings some goods to the market, arriving at a time when there is nobody who wants to trade. Does this mean the farmer must sit and wait for a customer in the marketplace, even though there is farm work to be done? <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. There will be people who identify this need and take care of the selling. In well-managed republics, they are commonly the people who are physically weakest and unable to do anything else. All they have to do is stay in the marketplace, take money from those who want to buy goods, and, in exchange, give money to those who want to sell. Then. This need will introduce retailers into our republic. A retailer is the name we give to the people who buy and sell in the agora, whereas those who go from one republic to another we call traders. Those are appropriate terms. There is one more group of workers that we would not include in our republic because of their intellect, but who are able to do hard physical labor, a service they sell for money. Mm -hmm. We call them laborers, another part of our population. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds good. And now, Adamantus, with the addition of laborers, is our republic complete? Perhaps it is. Then, where are justice and injustice? In what part of our republic can we find them? I can't imagine where they are to be found, unless it is in the relations of the citizens with each other. You may be right, but we should not leave it at that. We need to examine your suggestion carefully. Let's first consider their lifestyle as we have provided for it. Won't they produce uh, grain, wine? clothes and shoes, as well as build houses. They will work in the summer, stripped and barefoot, but in the winter they will wear both clothes and shoes. They will feed on barley meal and wheat flour, kneaded and baked, making excellent cakes and breads, serving them on a, a mat of reeds or clean leaves. While they feast, they and their children will recline on beds of yew or myrtle boughs, drinking wine, wearing garlands on their heads, and singing hymns to the gods. Uh, they will enjoy making love, but avoid producing too many children so that they can live within their means, avoiding poverty and war. But, Socrates, you haven't provided any delicacies for their banquet. True. I forgot about that. Of course they should have delicacies. Some salt, olives cheese, onions, and greens, boiled with herbs as they do in the country. For dessert, we will serve them uh, figs, chickpeas, and beans. They will drink in moderation while roasting myrtle berries and nuts over the fire. Living on such a diet, they can expect to live in peace and reach a ripe old age, passing on a similar life to their children. Right, Socrates. And if you were establishing a republic of pigs, isn't this exactly how you would feed them? Hmm. Then how would you do it, Glaucon? 
they should have the amenities of the good life. To be comfortable, people are used to lying on couches and dining from tables. They should have delicacies and dessert in the modern fashion. Now I understand. You don't merely want to consider how a republic comes into existence. You are interested in establishing a luxurious one. Well, that's not a bad idea, because in such a republic we are likely to see how justice and injustice develop. I think that we have already described a true republic, a healthy one. But if you would like to consider a luxurious one, let's do that. I suppose that few people will be satisfied with the simple life. They will want to add couches, tables, and other furniture, delicacies, perfumes, mm -hmm. incense, mm -hmm. and prostitutes and pastries of all kinds. <laughs> we should not limit our imagination to the needs I spoke about before, such as houses, clothes, and shoes. We must call upon painters and embroiderers, so gold, ivory, and similar materials will be needed. I agree. Then our original healthy republic is too small, so we must create a larger one. Mm -hmm. We must fill it with a multitude of occupations which go far beyond basic needs, such as hunters and imitators, both visual artists who work with shape and color, and musicians, mm -hmm. poets and the rhapsodists who cling to them, actors, dancers, contractors, and people who make all kinds of ornaments, especially the ones used by women. <laughs> and we will need more servants. Oh, won't we need tutors, wet nurses, babysitters, hairdressers, beauticians, pastry makers, and chefs? And what about swineherds? We didn't need them in the healthy republic, but now we need them and herds of other kinds of animals if people wish to eat meat. No doubt. With such a lifestyle, won't they have a greater need for doctors? Much greater. In our first republic, we had enough land to support our population. But won't they be too little now? You're right about that. Then we'll need a piece of our neighbor's land for pasture and farming. But they will want a piece of ours. If, like us, they go beyond basic needs and devote themselves to the unlimited acquisition of wealth... That seems to be inevitable. And then we will go to war... Glaucon. That will be the next step. I don't see how we can avoid it. Well, it's premature to say whether waging war produces good or bad, but we have already discovered the causes of war, which are also the causes of nearly all public and private evils in a republic. Well, that's for sure. Then once again, we must enlarge our republic, this time adding nothing less than a whole army one capable of fighting invaders to defend both our property and our citizens. Why? 